These two graphs give you some idea of Darwin and Wallace's relative fame. I produced them using Google's Ngram Viewer, which allows you to compare the relative frequencies of a number of terms, um, such as people's names, in about five million books over time. From the top graph, you can see that the geologist Charles Lyell was perhaps surprisingly far more famous than Charles Darwin until about the time of Darwin's death in 1882. Darwin then became and remained by far the most famous of the people shown. Wallace's name is the dark blue line. It is also interesting that citations of Darwin's name seem to really start accelerating in the late 1980s, which is around the time that the Darwin Correspondence Project started to publish his collected correspondence. It was largely thanks to this that people began to write more and more books about Darwin's life and work, and now there are literally hundreds of them. Comparing Wallace with some other famous biologists living and dead on the lower graph, we see that he uh, was more famous towards the end of his life, he died in 1913, uh, than any one of them at any um, time period except perhaps Richard Dawkins. <laughs> <laughs> As of uh, 2008, he was nearly as frequently cited as uh, Gregor Mendel, the discoverer of Mendelian genetics, and only Dawkins is considerably more cited than either. Interestingly, David Attenborough and Stephen Jay Gould are the least cited, apart from um, Lamarck, who devised a now discredited theory of evolution long before Darwin and Wallace came on the scene. Um, anyway, Myself, uh, the Memorial Fund, the Natural History Museum in London, and lots of other people around the world have been trying very hard to raise Wallace's profile this year, uh, since it is the 100th anniversary of his death, and therefore a very good excuse to highlight his many groundbreaking achievements. So, uh, these are Wallace's parents. But as we have seen, Wallace was one of the most famous scientists in the world around the time of his death in 1913, aged 90 years old. During his long life, he wrote more than a thousand articles and 22 books on a, a wide range of subjects. And in these, he included, he made many important contributions to many fields, including biology, geography, geology, and anthropology. His best known books are Darwinism, The Geographical Distribution of Animals in two massive volumes, um, a book called Island Life, and his famous um, travelogue, uh, the Malay Archipelago, uh, which was apparently jo Joseph Conrad's favourite bedside reading, <laughs> and which hasn't actually been out of print ever since it was published in 1869. His single most important scientific discovery was, of course, natural selection, which, um, as we all know, was not first published in Darwin's book On the Origin of Species, as a lot of people actually still believe. Wallace was born on the 8th of January, 1823, to a downwardly mobile middle-class couple, <laughs> Thomas Vere um, Wallace and Mary Ann Wallace. Wallace's father was um, a qualified solicitor, but he had never worked and been living off an inherited wealth, uh, which was gradually dwindling. Wallace was born in Kensington uh, Cottage, near Usk in Wales, which was actually, um, at that time, part of England. Wallace's father moved to us from London in an attempt to reduce um, living expenses. And when Wallace was five, he and his family moved to Hartford um, because uh, the family came into an inheritance after a relative died. And it was there at Hartford Grammar School that he received his only formal education. In about 1835, Wallace's father was swindled out of the, his remaining assets, and the family fell on extremely hard times. Wallace was forced to leave school in March 1837, when he was only 14, and after spending a few months with his brother John in London, he got a job with his oldest brother, William, uh, who was a land surveyor. William's work at the time involved carrying out the surveys and valuations required for carrying out the Commutation of Tithes Act of 1836, and also the enclosure of commons. Wallace and his brother would do such work for the next six and a half years, roaming all over the countryside of southern England and Wales. This is a sketch Wallace did place in Derbyshire. If anyone recognises it, please let me know. <coughs> I've often wondered where this place is. <laughs> 
In the autumn of 1841, uh, the Wallace brothers moved to the Neath area of Wales uh, to live and work. This is William Wallace's watercolour of the town of Neath as it then was. It was only very small then. So they moved to Neath to live and work, and it was there that several key events in Alfred's early life took place. To give you an idea of the work they were doing, this is one of the maps that Wallace made of the parish um, of, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, Lant with Jacques de Neath, which was actually um, only recently rediscovered with two of his other maps in the National Li Library of um, uh, Wales. It was whilst living in Neath in 1841 that Wallace's interest in natural history began. It started because he wanted to be able to identify the plants that he saw in the countryside whilst out surveying. He bought uh, his first books on how to identify them and also began to collect them, forming a collection of press specimens. In his autobiography, My Life, he explains how this happened. So this is a quote. During the larger portion of my residence at Neath, we, were very we had very little to do and my brother was often away, either seeking employment or engaged upon small matters of business in various parts of the country. I was thus left a good deal to my own devices, and having no friends of my own age, I occupied myself with various pursuits in which I began to take an interest. What occupied me chiefly and became more and more the solace and delight of my lonely rambles among the moors and mountains was my introduction to the variety, the beauty, and the mystery of nature as manifested in the veg vegetable kingdom. I soon found that by merely identifying the plants I found in my walks, I lost much time in gathering the same species several times, and even then not being always quite sure that I had found the same plant before. I therefore began to form a herbarium, collecting good specimens and drying them carefully between drying papers and a couple of boards weighed, that weighed down with books or stones. My brother, however, did not approve of my devotion to the study, even though I had absolutely nothing else to do, nor did he suggest any way in which I could um, employ my leisure more profitably. Neither he nor I could foresee um, that it would have any effect on my future life, and I myself only looked upon it as an intensely interesting occupation for time that was, would otherwise be wasted. Even when we were busy, I had um, Sundays perfectly free and used to take long walks over the mountains with my collecting box, which I brought home full of treasures. I first named the species as nearly as I could do so and then laid them out to be pressed and dried. At such times, I experienced the joy which every discovery of a new life uh, form gives to the lover of nature, almost equal to those raptures which I afterwards felt at every capture of new butterflies in <coughs> the Amazon, or at the constant stream of new species of birds, beetles and butterflies in Borneo, the Moluccas and the Aru Islands. Now, I have some reason to believe that this was the turning point in my life, the tide that carried me on, not to fortune but to whatever reputation I have acquired and which has certainly been, to me, a never-failing source of much health of body and supreme mental enjoyment. If my brother had had to consent, had constant work for me, so that I never had an idle day, and if I had continued to be similarly employed after I became of age, I should have most probably have become entirely absorbed in my profession, which in its various departments I have always found extremely interesting and should therefore um, have felt the need for, um, not have felt the need for any other occupation or study. In December 1843, paid land surveying work was scarce, so William suggested that, he, uh, that Wallace should try and find another job. And early in 1844, Wallace obtained a position teaching junior classes in English, surveying and elementary drawing at the Collegiate School in Leicester. So that's the Collegiate School, it still exists though it's got another use now. Leicester had a good library, and Wallace was able to study several important works on natural history and travel, including Malthus's Principles of Population, which he said uh, he greatly admired for its masterly summary of, summary of facts and logical induction to conclusions. It was probably in this library that he first met amateur naturalist Henry Walter Bates, who soon got Wallace passionate about collecting and studying beetles. Wallace was amazed by their many strange forms and often beautiful markings of colouring, and the fact that possibly a thousand species 
um, could be found within only 10 miles of the town. So that's Bates in the middle. In March 1845, Wallace's brother William died unexpectedly from a chest infection, and at Easter, Wallace quit his teaching job at Leicester and moved back to Neath uh, with his brother John in order to wind up William's affairs and continue the surveying business. However, he soon found that running the business, even with the help of John, involved responsibilities such as fee collection that he hated. Fortunately, he still had enough spare time uh, to continue with his natural history-related activities, and he also kept up a correspondence with his friend Bates. This is a, a bee chafer beetle, one of the most beautiful British beetles, which Wallace found in the Neath area, and it was the capture of this beetle was his first mention in, in print. Whilst living in Neath, uh, Alfred and John had some architectural and building work, which include designing a uh, mechanics building in Neath which still exists. It was completed in 1847 and officially opened in 1848. Despite experiencing a severe fire in 1903, the building still survives. It was in Neath in 1845 that Wallace first read Robert Chambers' controversial book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. The title page is there. And that was published anonymously the year before. Uh, this book was extremely popular reading at the time. Apparently, even Prince Albert read it aloud to the young Queen Victoria. Um, yeah, I wonder whether she was amused. <laughs> <laughs> Although not a scientific work, uh, Vestiges convinced Wallace of the reality of evolution, then known as transmutation. And in a letter to Bates dated 28th of December 1845, which we have in the Natural History Museum Library, he remarked, I have a rather more favourable opinion of the vestiges than you appear to have. I do not consider it a hasty generalisation, but rather as an ingenious hypothesis strongly supported by some striking facts and analogies, but which remains to be proved by more facts, and the additional light which future researchers may throw upon the subject. It at all events furnishes a subject for every observer of nature to turn his attention to. Every fact he observes must make either for or against it, and that it thus furnishes both an incitement to the collection of facts and an object to which to apply them when collected. A year or so um, after um, he wrote this, he was inspired by William Henry Edwards' book, A Voyage Up the Rio, um, the River Amazon. And in early 1848 or early 18, um, sorry, late 1847 or early 1848, Wallace suggested to Bates that they go to the Amazon to collect specimens of insects, birds, and other animals, both for their private collections and to sell to collectors and museums in Europe. The primary aim of the expedition, as far as Wallace was concerned, was to seek evidence for evolution and attempt to discover its mechanism. In a, a letter to Bates written about the time, this time, he says, I begin to feel rather dissatisfied with a mere local collection, Little is to be learnt by it. I should like to take some one family to study thoroughly, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. By that means, I am strongly of the opinion that some definite results might be arrived at. Bates liked the idea of a tropical collecting trip, and the two men, at that time Wallace was 25 and Bates 23, set off by ship from Liverpool to Pará, now known as Belém on the 26th of April, 1848. At first they worked as a team, but after a few months they apparently quarrelled and split up to collect in different areas. Uh, this is Bates. Wallace primarily collected butterflies and birds, two of which you can see here. These are actually Wallace specimens from the Amazon. That's the, the label. He centred his activities in the, the middle Amazon and Rio Negro. The kind of reddish line is the, the route of his trip. And he journeyed up the Rio Negro uh, further than any other Westerner had been. And using uh, the skills he had learned when he was a land surveyor, he drafted the first ever map of the, the river. It was published by the Royal Geographical Society in London when he returned home and proved accurate enough to become the standard for many decades. This is his um, published 
Rio Negro map. I don't know whether you know the Rio Negro, but it's one of the world's biggest rivers, even though it's you know just a tributary of the, the Amazon. Wallace was remarkably skillful in being able to uh, map the river just with a, a compass and timing canoes going up and down the river, etc. Anyway, um, by early 1852, Wallace was in poor health and in no condition to continue traveling. He decided to return to England and began, began the long trip back down the Rio Negro and Amazon to Pará. Passing through Pará, now known as Manaus, Wallace found to his dismay that most of the specimens that he had been sending down river for the preceding two years um, had been delayed by the officials there because they were worried that the boxes might contain uh, contraband goods. So after declaring their content, he collected the six, six large cases and set sail for England on the brig Helen on the 12th of July. Tragically, 26 days into the voyage, when he was in the middle of the Atlantic, his ship caught fire and sank, taking with it all the specimens he had collected during the last two years of his trip, <coughs> plus his collection of live animals and most of his field notes. So the red dot marks the exact position that Wallace's ship sank. All he managed to rescue was a tin box containing a few shirts into which he quickly put his watch, some money drawings he had made of the fishes and palms of, um, in the Amazon, and the diary he kept on the Rio Negro, plus a few notes and observations of uh, the Rio Negro and Varpes rivers. These are some of the, the drawings which he rescued from the, his smoke-filled um, cabin on the burning ship. We have all the fish drawings at the Natural History Museum. There's four sketchbooks full of them, and the palm drawings at the Linnean Society. Wallace and the, the crew struggled to survive on a, bad, a pair of badly leaking lifeboats, and fortunately, after 10 days drifting on the open ocean, they were picked up by a passing cargo ship making its way back to England. They landed at Deal in England on the 1st of October, 1852. Luckily, Wallace's agent, Samuel Stevens, who had dealt with all the, the collections he had been sending back in the first two years of the trip and been selling them to museums and private collectors, um, had had the foresight to insure Wallace's collections for £200. Wallace later estimated that they were worth about £500, but it was certainly a lot better than nothing. Although Wallace made many important discoveries during his four years on the Amazon, he did not manage to find the elusive mechanism of evolution. He did, however, manage to write two books in the year after his return, one on the palm trees of the Amazon and their uses, and another about his travels, which had to be largely written from memory since most of his diaries had been destroyed. He also published an important paper on the monkeys of the Amazon in which he noted that big rivers were barriers to monkey species. One species was found on one bank of the river and a closely related species on the other bank. This seemed to Wallace to run against the idea of special creation by God. <coughs> After all, why would God create separate species on different sides of a river? <laughs> um, Wallace's river rhyme barrier hypothesis um, is still actually a topic of um, research today. Shortly after returning to England, Wallace had vowed never to travel on a boat in the ocean again. <laughs> but good resolutions soon fade, and about a year later, in March 1854, he left Britain on a collecting expedition to the Malay Archipelago, which is now Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. This is difficult to see, but um, it's a map of that part of Southeast Asia. And the uh, lines between the islands, the black lines, are actually Wallace's route. He spent nearly eight years in this region and undertook 60 or 70 separate journeys, often in small native boats and canoes, resulting in uh, a combined total of about 14,000 miles of travel. He visited every major island in the archipelago at least once and several on multiple occasions and collected an astonishing a total of 110,000 insect specimens, 7,500 shells, 8,050 bird skins, 410 mammal and reptile specimens, and including probably over 5,000 species new to science. The book he later wrote describing his work and experiences there, the Malay Archipelago, is the most celebrated of all travel writings of this region, region and ranks with a few other works um, as one of the best scientific travel books of the 19th century.
I estimate that 80% of all of Wallace's specimens are actually now in the Natural History Museum collections, having been bought either directly from Wallace, Wallace's agent, or coming to the museum through other collections which were bequeathed to the museum. Here are a few of the specimens he collected in his time in the Malay Archipelago. I think most of them are at the museum, maybe a few at Cambridge. So this is just a random selection of mainly moths, including one of the largest moths in the world, the Atlas moth in the center. There's a female and male. A drawer of assorted insects, including what he called the giant shielded katydid, which is the biggest specimen. And it's that actual specimen that he illustrated in his book um, by a beautiful woodcut. And it's one of the largest um, orthopterans in the world, only found the island of New Guinea. There's one of his hornbill specimens, parrot skull. These are two of the most celebrated species that he actually discovered whilst out there. There's Wallace's golden birdwing butterfly, which I've sort of made the symbol of this Wallace here. Uh, it's a magnificent species, about six inch wingspan, and um, he was really overwhelmed when he caught the first specimen. And Wallace's standard wing bird of paradise. He was very lucky to discover a new bird of paradise because a lot of species were already known by them. And he considered it one of his greatest zoological discoveries. Uh, one of Wallace's most productive collecting localities in Southeast Asia was near the Samunjan Coal Works in Sarawak in Borneo. Uh, sorry, these are some of his, his notebooks, uh, which are in the Linnaean Society. So that's the position of Samunjan in, in Borneo, in Sarawak. And he recalls in his book that when I arrived at the mines on the 14th of March, I had collected in the preceding four months 320 different kinds of beetles. In less than a fortnight, I doubled this number, an average of about 24 new species every day. <laughs> on one day, I collected 76 different kinds, of which 34 were new to me. By the end of April, I had more than a thousand species, and they then went on increasing at a slower rate, so that I obtained altogether in Borneo about 2,000 distinct kinds, of which all but about 100 were collected at this place, and on scarcely more than a square mile of ground. These are some of the beautiful watercolour paintings that we have in the Natural History Museum that Wallace actually did when he was at the Samunjan coal mines. And it was here that he famously shot and collected orangutans. Uh, he personally um, shot about 15 um, specimens, yeah, individuals in total. And he reared a baby of one of the females he killed. This is actually the, the female that he shot that had the baby, and it's in our collection at the Natural History Museum. It's currently on display as part of the Wallace Discovery Trail, which is on at the moment. He shot this mother, and she had a, a young baby, which he hadn't noticed at the time. When he found it, he decided to try and uh, rear it up. And he says in a, a, said in a letter to his mother that at the time, um, with this orphan, my baby is no common baby, and I can safely say what so many have said before with much less truth, there never was such a baby as my baby. <laughs> and I am sure nobody ever had such a dear little duck of a darling of a brown hairy baby before. <laughs> Unfortunately, despite lavishing a lot of care and attention on it, it had died after a few weeks from internal injuries caused by the fall. And being a good collector and businessman, he pickled it in a cask of local <laughs> and sold it to the Natural History Museum for six pounds. <laughs> uh, various people have tried to find it in the zoology collections, but unfortunately it seems to have been lost. We now come to the first of the three um, most important scientific papers which Wallace wrote during this trip. In February 1855, whilst he was staying in a tiny rest house owned by his friend, the ruler of Sarawak, Roger James Brooke, Wallace wrote what was to become one of the most important papers on evolution published by anyone prior to the discovery of natural selection. The title of the paper is On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species. And he recounts in his autobiography that the paper was written 
uh, during the wet season, whilst I was staying in a little house at the mouth of the Sarawak River at the foot of Santa Bon Mountain. I was quite alone with one Malay boy as cook, and during the evenings and wet days I had nothing to do but to look over my books and ponder over the problem. Having always been interested in the geographical distribution of animals and plants, and having now myself a vivid impression of the fundamental differences between the eastern and western tropics, and having also read through such books as Bonaparte's Conspectus, giving a mass of facts as to the distribution of animals over the whole world, it occurred to me that these facts had never been properly utilized as indications of the, ways, the way in which species have come into existence. The great work of Lyle, i.e. Principles of Geology, had furnished me with the main features of the succession of species in time, in geological time. And by combining the two, I thought that some valuable conclusions might be reached. I accordingly put my facts and ideas on paper, and the result seeming to me to be of some importance, I sent it to the Annals and Magazine of Natural History, in which it appeared in the, the following September, 1855. Its title was On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species, which law was briefly stated as follows. Every species has come into existence in existence, coincident both in time and space with a pre-existing closely allied species. This clearly pointed to some kind of evolution. It suggested the when and where of its occurrence and that it could only be through natural generation as was also suggested in the vestiges. But the how was still a secret only penetrated some years later. Uh, he continues, soon after the article appeared, Mr. Stevens, um, his agent in London, wrote to me that he um, had heard several naturalists express regret that I was theorizing when what, was, what he had to do was to collect more facts. After this, I had, um, in a letter to Darwin, expressed surprise that no notice appeared to be taken of my paper, to which he replied that both Sir Charles Lyell and Mr. Edward Blythe, two very good men, specially called his attention to it. In fact, Wallace's Sarawak Law paper made such an impression on Charles Lyell that in November 1855, soon after reading it, he started writing a species notebook in which he be began to contemplate the implications of evolutionary change for the first time, as well, uh, Lyell was a creationist. In April 1856, Lyell paid a visit to Darwin at Down House, and Darwin divulged his theory of natural selection to Lyell for the first time an idea which Darwin had been working on more or less in secret for around 20 years. Soon afterwards, Lyle sent a letter to Darwin <coughs> urging him to publish the theory, least someone beat him to it. Um, he almost certainly had Wallace in mind. So in May 1856, Darwin, heeding his advice, began to write a sketch of his ideas for publication. Finding the sketch just too short and unsatisfactory, Darwin abandoned it in about October 1856, and instead began to write an extensive book on the subject, um, his, which is known as his Big Species Book. In May 1856, about a year after he wrote um, the Sarawak Law Paper, Wallace took a Chinese schooner from Bali to Singapore, sorry, Singapore to Bali. Uh, he had no intention of staying in Bali, uh, but he figured that he could find a way from there to Lombok and then to Makassar on the island of Sulawesi. <clears throat> this accidental detour would give Wallace the second most important discovery of his trip. On Bali, Wallace found similar species of birds to the other islands he had visited to the west, including a weaver, woodpecker, thrush, or starling, groups he had seen and collected in Borneo, Sumatra, Singapore, and Peninsular Malaysia. But then, I'm quoting him, Crossing over to Lombok, separated from Bali by a strait less than 20 miles wide, I naturally expected to meet with some of these birds again, but during a stay there of three months, I never saw one of them. Instead, Wallace found a completely different assortment, white cockatoos, three species of honeysuckers, a loud bird that the locals called keech keech, and a peculiar megapod which used its large uh, feet to make very large mounds in which to incubate its eggs. None of these groups were known on the western islands of um, Java. So that's Java 
Um, Sumatra, that's Peninsula Malaysia. Yeah, so they, th none of those groups were known on the, the Western Islands. So now here was a puzzle. What constraint prevented the spread of these species from island to island? Surely birds could cover a 20 mile strait with little trouble. This is a, a shot that I took on the ferry when we travelled from uh, Bali to Lombok. So there's um, Bali at the top and uh, Lombok, which is a sort of lower lying island, um, certainly in the south part of it. So, yeah, surely the birds could cover the, the 20 mile uh, strait with little trouble. Um, but uh, they obviously hadn't. Wallace described the mystery in a letter to Bates early in. 1858, he theorized that there was some kind of invisible boundary line between Bali and Lombok. Traveling further east to Flores and Timor, the Aru Islands and New Guinea, the changeover in bird life was very clear. All the families of birds that were common on Sumatra, Java and Borneo were absent from Aru, New Guinea or Australia and vice versa. So here are some birds from both sides of the line. So this is a barbed, uh, one of Wallace's specimens actually, from west of the line. And that's a cassowary from east of the line. Cassowaries only occur in New Guinea and Australia. Differences in mammals among the western and eastern islands were just as striking. On the large western islands there were monkeys, tigers and uh, rhinos. But in Australia and nearby islands there were um, no primates or carnivores. All the uh, native mammals were marsupials, kangaroos, cuscus, and the like. The line between Bali and Lombok signified something very profound to Wallace. He put his thoughts on paper again, publishing an article in 1857 entitled On the Natural History of the Aru Islands. Wallace explained that under the doctrine of special creation by God, which people like Charles Lyell believed in, one would expect to find similar animals in countries with similar climates and dissimilar animals in countries with dissimilar climates. This is not at all what he saw. For example, in comparing uh, the island of Borneo um, to the west of his line and New Guinea to the east, just above Australia, he observed that it would be difficult to point um, out two lands more exactly resembling each other in climate and physical features, but their birds and animals uh, were, their birds and mammals were entirely different. Wallace reasoned further that some other law has regulated the distribution of existing species. That law, Wallace suggested, was his Sarawak law that he proposed two years earlier. Again, Wallace relied on geology to make his case. He surmised that New Guinea, Australia, and Aru must have been connected at some point in the past and so shared similar sets of birds and mammals. Similarly, Wallace deduced that the Western Islands had once been part of Asia and so shared the fauna of tropical Asia, monkeys, tigers, etc. Wallace was right. He had linked the question of the origin of species to how species are, were distributed, and he had defined a dividing line between the fauna of Asia and Australasia. His discovery would be forever known as uh, the Wallace Line, and because of this and his <coughs> later important books on animal distribution, Wallace is considered to be the founder of modern evolutionary biogeography. For Wallace, the question was then not if species evolved, but how. In early 1858, whilst he was staying in a hut um, on, in the village of Dodinga on the huge and largely unexplored Indonesian island of Halmahira, he at last discovered the elusive mechanism for which he had been searching for the past 10 years. In his book, Natural Selection and Tropical Nature, he recounts the story of his great discovery. And he says, um, after writing the preceding paper, The Sarawak Law, the question of how changes of species could have been brought about was rarely out of my mind, but no satisfactory conclusion was reached till February 1858. At that time, I was suffering from a rather severe attack of intermittent fever, and one day, whilst lying on my bed during the cold fit, wrapped in blankets, though the temperature was 88 degrees Fahrenheit, the problem again presented itself to me, and something led me to think of the positive checks described by Malthus in his essay on population, a work I had read several years before, and which had made a deep and permanent impression on my mind. These checks, war, disease, famine and the like, must, it occurred to me, act on animals as well as on man, 
Then I thought of the enormously rapid multiplication of animals, causing these checks to be much more effective in them than in the case of man. And whilst pondering vaguely on this fact, there suddenly flashed upon me the idea of the survival of the fittest, that individuals removed by these checks must be, on the whole, inferior to those that survived. In the two hours that elapsed before my egg fit, fit was over, I had thought out almost the whole of the theory, and in the same evening I sketched a draft of my paper, and in the two succeeding evenings wrote it out in full, and sent it by the next post to Mr. Darwin. And this is Mr. Darwin. Wallace decided to send his essay to Darwin because he knew from correspondence uh, that Darwin was interested in the subject of species transmutation, as evolution was then called, although he had no idea that Darwin had already discovered the mechanism. He asked Darwin to pass the essay on to Lyell if Darwin thought it was sufficiently interesting, probably hoping that Lyell would be impressed and perhaps send, it, send back some useful comments. Lyell, who Wallace had never been in contact with, was one of the most respected scientists of the time, if not the most respected scientists at the time. And Wallace must have thought that he would be interested to learn about his new theory because it explained the evolutionary law which Wallace had proposed in his 1855 paper. Darwin had, of course, mentioned in a letter to Wallace that Lyell had found his Sarawak law paper uh, noteworthy. This is a, a sketch by Wallace of uh, the islands around um, Ternate. Um, it was from the Spice Island of Ternate, which is a volcanic cone here, uh, that he posted the, the famous essay to Darwin. Wallace's packet to Darwin containing um, his essay and a covering letter was, was posted from um, Ternate off the coast of Halmahira on the 9th of March, 1858, and it probably arrived at Darwin's house in Down, Kent on the 18th of June, 1858. When Darwin received Wallace's essay, he was understandably horrified, um, and he immediately sent it with a letter to Lyle, appealing for advice on what to do. Uh, Darwin asked Lyle to contact another of um, Darwin's influential friends, the well-known botanist Joseph Hooker, and to cut a long story short, uh, Lyle and Hooker decided that the best course of action was to pre present uh, Wallace's essay without even trying to ask his permission along with two unpublished excerpts from Darwin's writing on the subject, to a meeting of the Linnaean Society of London on July the 1st, 1858, only 14 days after Wallace's letter had arrived in England. These documents were published together in the Society's journal about a month later as the paper on the tendency of species to form varieties and on the perpetuation of varieties and species by natural means of selection. Darwin's contributions were placed before Wallace's essay, thus emphasizing Darwin's priority to the idea. Wallace later grumbled that his essay was printed without my knowledge and, of course, without any correction of proofs, contradicting Lyle and Hooker's untrue statement in the introduction to it that both authors have unreservedly placed their papers in our hands. <laughs> this unfortunate episode prompted prompted Darwin to abandon writing his big book on evolution, and instead he rushed to produce an abstract of what he had written up to that point. So this was the book that was prompted by Wallace's 1855 paper. So Dar uh, Wallace was actually doubly responsible for the, the origin of species, bizarrely enough. This abstract was published 15 months later, on, in November 1859, as obviously famous or on the origin of species. Wallace spent the rest of his long life developing and defending the theory of natural selection, as well as working on an extremely wide range of other, sometimes controversial, subjects. By the turn of the century, Wallace was probably Britain's best-known naturalist, and by the time of his death in 1913, he may well have been one of the world's most famous people. So why, you might ask, do most people who know something about the history of the, the theory of natural selection think that Darwin first published the idea in the origin? And why is Wallace remembered by relatively few people today? It's, this is actually a, a tricky question because the explanation has to take into account that during Wallace's lifetime he was widely acknowledged to be the co-discoverer of the theory. In fact, natural selection was often called the Darwin-Wallace theory and the highest possible honours of the land were bestowed on Wallace for his, co his role as co-discoverer. 
These include the Darwin, Wallace and Linnaean Gold Medals of the Linnaean Society of London, the Copley, Darwin and Royal Medals of the Royal Society and the Order of Merit, which was awarded by the ruling monarch as the highest civilian honour of Great Britain. Um, it's only in the 20th century that Wallace became almost totally eclipsed by Darwin. I really like this letter that we have in the Natural History Museum. I think it's highly ironic. It's from the Royal Society in 1890. Sir, I have the pleasure to inform you that the President and Council of the Royal Society have awarded to you the Darwin Medal for your, <laughs> for your independent origination of the theory of origin of species by natural selection. <laughs> The best explanation um, I can think of um, to explain the overshadowing of Wallace by Darwin um, goes as follows. In the late 19th and tw early 20th century, natural selection as an explanation for evolutionary change actually became incredibly unpopular. It was called the period that is called the eclipse of Darwinism. Most um, uh, biologists at that time uh, believed in evolution, and they had been convinced. But they adopted alternative theories such as neo-Lamarckism, which actually Darwin was responsible for because he downplayed um, natural selection um, in pro progressive editions of his Origin of Species. And his final edition of Origin of Species is highly um, uh, Lamarck Lamarckian, and natural selection was uh, downplayed. And he even uh, developed an entire theory um, to explain how Lamarckism worked, which he called pangenesis, and it said that information came from all the cells of the body. So um, features that were acquired during the life of the organism um, were propagated as gemmules, which then migrated to the sex cells and um, could pass on information from the whole body. Because, of course, Darwin and Wallace didn't know about modern genetics and how it worked. So there were all kinds of theories, neo-Lamarckism, orthogenesis, um, or the mutation theory, also called the, the hopeful monster theory, because it said that species arose in one giant mutation, so um, uh, a female could give birth to offspring which were actually a different species that were so different from it they couldn't interbreed with the mother. So how this exactly worked, I don't know, maybe if a whole, um, the mother had lots of offspring, then that would form the, the start of a new species. Um, anyway, in fact, um, during this period, Wallace and August Weissman were the only two prominent biologists who supported the theory of natural selection. Um, so this is in the 1880s after Darwin's death. And it was only with the, the modern evolutionary synthesis of the 1930s and 40s that natural selection became the generally accepted um, theory amongst biologists as the primary mechanism of evolutionary change. Of course, it's not the only mechanism of evolutionary change, as sexual selection and genetic drift is another mechanism by which evolution can occur. Um, anyway, by the time natural selection was kind of rediscovered, uh, the, the history of the discovery had been forget forgotten by many, because there was a new generation of biologists and you know, there had been sort of two world wars. When, it, when interest in the theory revived, many wrongly assumed that the idea had been first published in Darwin's origin. So thanks to the Darwin industry of recent decades, Darwin's fame has increased exponentially, ex eclipsing the important contributions of his contemporaries like Wallace. Hopefully the worldwide celebrations and publicity about Wallace this year to commemorate the 100th anniversary of his death will help raise awareness of his amazing life an incredible scientific work considerably. Anyway, um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for listening.